expresses joy after his father's alleged killer was captured after eight years. Amerindians and Minister Gabidolo calls on May schools to apologize for discriminating against Amerindians. Route 42 bus drivers protest for bus fares to be hiked. Exxon Mobil continues to reassure Guyanese fishermen that their livelihood will not be affected. Those were the top headlines for the week ending June 1. I'm Sandy Ramutar. Good afternoon. Starting things off on MTV News Updates Weekend Review, we tell you that two prison officers have found themselves in hot water. They have been arrested after police suspected them to be involved in the transportation of marijuana to the Lusignan prison. Nikhil John Lu tells us more. Director of Prisons Gladwin Samuels says the two officers were stopped during a police operation on the east coast of Demerara last night. He added that the officers were questioned as to why they were carrying the contraband to the Lusignan prison. However, the officers' answers were outrageous. Samuels further added that the embattled officers can face monetary fines and dismissal. So they're fresh from training school, basically. And they are aware that they do not have the authority to take any items into the prison for any prisoner. Yet, his ex one of the um, officers' excuse was that he collected the items with the belief that it was eatables to take for a prisoner breakfast. Ridiculous. First is that you're not authorized to collect these items. Secondly, even if for some reason you collect the items, what prevented you from checking to verify what it's the content of what you're collecting? And then the person who collected the items give it to another prison officer who placed it in his haversack. The director of prisons believes that an officer who was stationed at the Lusignan Holding Bay for allegedly throwing contraband into the prison is behind the marijuana trade. He stated that the two officers were in contact with the officer who was interdicted moments before collecting the compressed marijuana at the Georgetown Public Hospital. Sam Wells opined that when contraband gets into the hands of inmates, they endanger the lives of fellow prisoners and the prison officers on duty. These ranks who were either previously engaged in the trafficking of contraband or recently recruited to traffic contraband into the prison were used in order to um, take the items in. However, one person indicated, as I mentioned last evening, he was paid $20,000 to take this item in. Now, my question to him was, which civilian would pay you $20,000 to take pastries into the prison? He cannot answer me till now because, I mean, they are aware, fully aware of what they're doing. They're fully aware of the danger they expose um, officers to. And even inmates, when they smoke, they tend not to operate normal. So they endanger the lives of um, other inmates. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Former head of the Special Weapons and Tactics Unit, Deputy Superintendent Moti Duki, has been sent on special leave. However, Minister of Public Security Kamar Dramjitan would have wanted him to stay on the job as he continues to earn taxpayers' dollars off duty. Here is more. Minister of Public Security Kamar Dramjitan said that policemen engaging in illegal actions should be fired. This followed an investigation against Commander of the Special Weapons and Tactics Unit, Deputy Superintendent Moti Duki. In December last, Duki was busted with 30 cases of smuggled whiskey in a minibus. However, he thinks the rule of law should take its course in alliance with the Police Service Commission. Uh, the implications of it, and that is why I didn't touch it. I said wait until the Police Service Commission. But in my absence, he touched it, and I do not want to go down because he was performing the functions of the public security minister. Just like when, remember when Ram Narayan was performing the functions of the commissioner, he promoted a couple of people, and then Silal came and told him, no, I had to restore it because when you're performing, um, you can do it, and it is valid and legitimate and legal. Um, but uh, I'm, I'll be taking a look at the the, 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 um, and that, that is why I'm trying to advise myself. Ramjitan says he would have preferred Duki to stay on the job, serving in a different capacity, as he's still being paid by the state whilst being off duty. 
Dukey was sent on special leave through instructions by the then Acting Minister of Public Security, Winston Felix. Minister Ramjatan was said to be on travel duties at the time. Sandy Ramutar, Frame TV's News Update. An inmate survey was conducted following the 2016 disturbance and fire at the Camp Street prison that claimed the lives of 17 inmates. That survey highlights the need for better living conditions for prisoners, says Public Security Minister. Nikadondo filed this report. The final report on the Guyana Prison Service inmate survey was handed over today. The survey was funded by the Inter-American Development Bank. A team from Argentina and the University of Guyana conducted the survey, which was done throughout the prison facilities. Director of Prisons Gladwin Samuels says the survey brought out the fundamental of what is taking place among inmates and the treatment they are receiving. He noted that the inmates were comfortable that the study was conducted by independent researchers, which proved useful to relate what is taking place. We have recognized the importance of making adjustments so that the prison service and the government of Ghana will not be cited for being in a, at a state where we are not treating prisoners humanely. It is as a result of this several efforts are being made through the Ministry of Public Security to ensure that our infrastructure, which, which plays a major role in terms of providing better housing, and training facilities for prisoners are modernized. Minister of Public Security Kemraj Ramjatan welcomed the final report, citing that the recommendations will be taken seriously by the government. He too noted that the inmates were free to talk with the researchers. One out of four inmates reported that their father or mother's partner used to beat their mothers. In four out of ten cases, the inmates' parents or adults with whom they lived as children drank alcohol frequently. One out of five inmates said that their gangs or members belonging to criminal groups in the neighborhood where they lived as minors. Four out of ten inmates stated that they had a family member who had been sent to prison before. Minister Ramjitan also cited that the report highlights the need for prison officers to treat inmates in a humane way. He also commended the prison authority in weeding out rogue officers. Of course, we know the prison administration has started a commendable process of weeding out some corrupt officers. I noticed another one got caught with marijuana this morning, who jeopardized the safety of their colleagues by facilitating the trafficking of contraband. We need to employ intelligence-led operations and technology to identify the perpetrators so that they can be brought to justice and not continue to disrupt efforts to rehabilitate inmates and make the prison an unsafe place. Quite frankly, of recent times, I have been very embarrassed and become afraid of some of these rogue elements within the prison service. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. On a tragic note, a late afternoon fire has left a family homeless and millions of dollars in losses. Nikhil John Do tells us more. I don't know. I just yeah, came off the road. I know, but we're just seeking to do our job. You are not doing your job. You are being nosy. That is it. Because I am here, I don't know what has happened. I have not spoken to the people of the fire. And you want to know what happened? Fire yesterday afternoon engulfed the house at Danwright Street, New Tankiti. The proprietor was not at home when the blaze began. The house was owned by an employee of the Ghana Power and Light Company. Three persons, including the woman's daughter and two caretakers, were at home. They escaped unhurt but were unable to save anything from the building. Like the little girl in the house, like she died or something, like something in the house or something. And we come to this big day after you, right? The firemen then walk, no doubt. It took a little while to come, but when it comes, was action. Firefighters responded quickly to the scene and contained the blaze to only one building. The building was insured. Investigations are in progress. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. 
Waiting 18 years for justice can be daunting. One young man has that experience after witnessing his father being brutally chopped to death. Nikhil Jondu has more. The Achan Singh of Hope West and more East Coast Demerara is now 28 years old, having a wife and children. The young man spoke with this newscast on Monday after law enforcement officers arrested the man suspected to be his father's killer. Singh recalled that he was 10 years old when the brutal murder took place at their former house, which was dilapidated. The man said he witnessed his father, Daniel Singh, and three of their dogs being brutally chopped by the suspect, Dianarine Bikari. Singh said after his father's death, he and his brother had to leave school and seek employment to sustain their family. The man added that the murder suspect then migrated to neighboring Venezuela since 2000. However, only three months ago, the murder suspect returned to Guyana. On his arrival in this country, I was being told when Mr. Mark Ramutar took him to a funeral at Mahaika, my maid came to me and said that she saw the person who killed my father. And from then I took the information and I started to work with it. And my trace, I mean you all will know at this time, people will not give you all information without having reward. And I launched a reward secretly for whoever had the information to come forward with the information so of the recapture. I traced him for over three months while his father were moving him and his nephew were taking him back him in the afternoon. But I didn't go ahead because you know that the connection at the end with the PPP and then because of, you know, the dangerous time, I just try to keep doing everything. But it come to a time that, you know, everything had to come to an halt with him and he had to surrender. Yesterday morning I was heading to the beach when a person came to me and he said, I got the information where the guy is. On his arrival, he will inform me. I then informed my attorney at law, Mr. James Anthony Bond, and I informed the relevant authority and we took step into the matter. And on our arrival, he was in the yard. And there comes, I call at the gate, he cannot remember me after 18 years. And I identify him positive and the police and my attorney arrested him and took him to the Copenhagen police station. Singh said he has now learned that the file is missing from the police records. He believes that the suspect's son was behind the missing files. Singh says he is waiting patiently for the matter to be investigated and to bring the murder suspect to justice. We always try to get a brighter future, but it is hurtful to not have my father after you know, so many years. We work so hard to achieve everything that we achieve, but it's very painful to know that 18 years on, we now got justice after waiting so long. But there is a God, and I always believe in God. I always pray for the day that comes. It comes now. Widow Anjani Singh says she is now feeling sorrowful because she had to care for her three children all by herself. To make sure that I try with them, I give them education and make them so much. Without no one help me, I had no one to give me nothing. I work domestic work, I work security work day and night. When I come off and domestic again in the night for the security, when was the 2005 flood water till at midnight going out nine, nine ten o'clock at night to work, just to maintain them. Without no one helping, not a neighbor, not a family, no one. And uh, he hurt me today, he hurt me a lot. And what is just at the back there? The man lives just at the back there. So every time you go up the step or every time you turn and you look there, it hurt. Dana Ryan Vicari is in police custody at the Coven John Police Station. Investigators held a confrontation on Monday with the murder suspect and the victims. A statement was collected from the suspect who denied that he committed the brutal attack. Investigations are in progress. Nikhil Chondo reporting for MTV News Update. 
Amerindians on Tuesday braved the hot midday sun and protested in front of May schools for refusing entry of a student who dressed as an Amerindian on a school sculpture day. The protesters are calling for a public apology. Yanis Abrams with the details. Several organizations from the indigenous community protested in front of May's schools today in light of the administration's action to send home one of the students of Amerindian descent after he dressed accordingly on the school's culture day. That incident occurred on Friday, May 25. Mother of the nine-year-old child, Karen Small, disclosed to media operatives that the school was having a culture day for the students. However, approaching the school's gate, Small said the guard was hesitant to allow the child into the compound. There were teachers that were standing around and she was asking them, is it okay to go upstairs? And they were laughing. Nobody came in representation of this child. Nobody embraced the child to say it was okay. So when he got upstairs, I asked the teacher um, if it was okay for him to be like this, um, particularly the art teacher, because there were a few of them were standing there and she said, no, it's a school. You shouldn't dress like this. It's inappropriate for him to dress like this. Nevertheless, I went, I went back to work. By the time Joshua was already crying, so he didn't realize that I walked behind him and he turned to his friends and he said, you know, I really hate how I look. This is a child that left home very proud, as always, to, to embrace this culture and embrace his heritage, only to come here to be shoot down to say, I hate how I look. The mother, whilst maintaining her composure, said that the school has not attempted to contact or apologize to her. She affirmed that an apology is necessary whilst emphasizing on the disrespect that was shown to indigenous people. Chairman of the National Tushal Council, Joel Fredericks, said a public apology is needed from the school's administration. Fredericks also lashed out at the Ministry of Social Cohesion, questioning its inaction. Where is the Ministry of Social Cohesion in this? Because I am aware of the Ministry of Social Cohesion going to villages and talking about cohesion, and where are they now? They should have been here, they should have do something, meet with this, the principal and, and deal with it. So that is why we are out here. A statement from the Amerindian People's Association noted that the Constitution states that indigenous people have the rights to protect, preservation and promulgation of their language, cultural heritage and way of life. The association added that the school impinged on the right of the student to practice his culture and freely express his identity. The media was not allowed to enter the compound to speak to the administrators. Meanwhile, during a televised program last evening, Junior Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Valerie Greedelo, also called for the school to apologize to the child and his family. But culture day, that's mm -hmm. culture day. You want to wear something then that depicts your heritage. Indigenous month. Everybody does that. Mm -hmm. And not only um, indigenous people, everybody then remember, mo lots of Guyanese remember that they have a bit of indigenous, indigenous blood. <laughs> so they either wear the feathers, <coughs> the bands, the chain, and they're happy. Yes. So I don't see anything wrong with that. And um, I think that um, they should have thought about it some more and view it as his culture mm -hmm. and invite him in and explain if somebody if the rest of students don't understand take it as a a teaching moment yeah. reporting for mtv's news update i am yanis abrams the new board of the Guyana Civil Aviation Authority has promised to be vigilant and frank in their decision-making process, placing safety at the forefront. Here's more. The eight-members board of the Guyana Civil Aviation Authority is chaired by retired Lieutenant Cornell Lawrence London. Minister within the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, Annette Ferguson, charged the directors to work in partnership with the government. She also called on the board to establish a working environment to free of discrimination. 
Rest assured, we will give full support to your activities and the programs you have. My appeal also to your, my charge to you also, is let us ensure that the working environment is one that is free from discrimination and victimization. The chairman of the GCAA board says the installation of the board will pave the way for frank decision making. He asserted that the board will be vigilant in ensuring there is a safe, secure and economically viable aviation system. Um, this board is going to be very different. We are going to make decisions. We are not going to be whipped into making decisions. You're going to have to put brakes on us. You're not going to whip us to, to get it done. Put brakes and we are all right. London replaces Director General, retired Lieutenant Colonel Egbert Fields and will serve for two years in that capacity. In a complete disappointment and rage early on Wednesday, several of 42 minibus drivers gathered under the heat of the midday sun in front of the Ministry of the Presidency, protesting against what they called an injustice. There is presently a rise in the price of gasoline, but the minibus fares for the east bank of the Murat and Georgetown route have remained the same. The Shanagom Screeliness filed that report. The drivers claimed that they visited the Ministry of Public Infrastructure to get some answers, but were referred to the Ministry of Business. Upon their arrival at the Ministry of Business, the drivers protested to relay their frustration to the Minister of Business, Dominic Gaskin. But to their shocking awakening, the minister boldly informed them that he was in no way responsible for the increase in the price of gas and that they were blocking the path of his vehicle. Once more feeling completely disrespected and betrayed by the government, the drivers continue to lament on the steps that ought to be taken to reverse the issue. It had, it had something years ago, but now when we try to do anything, as you can see what we're telling this man, it's pushed around from three different ministries that we say. Nobody giving no satisfaction, nobody talking to you, you asking, tell people straight, he ain't got time to talk to nobody, tell the driver get to out of the place. Yeah. When you see we come, you drive away. Yeah, because we get sent from from from, um, from from Kingston to South Road to Sophia, then we come here. Number one, the amount of gas we are through, you didn't make it back in the afternoon. You got to pay target all. Something you're going with $2,000. Whole, whole day, from 6 o'clock to 6 o'clock. You got to pay conductor. You got to pay yourself. It's me and my wife that's work, so we just accept what we get. But it's overbearing now, man. Yes, it is three times already for one month. He not listened to me. I asked him to listen to us for two seconds. He just drove away. This is why we come to the president. We spoke to the president, liaison officer, where we get somewhere. He told us that the Ministry of Instruction, Mr. Patterson, who is responsible for that. I told him that we were there, a PS in front of me. No. It seems to me a PS don't know his function. I keep telling the PS that yes, this command, his ministry, he said no. The drivers explained that for the longest while, the Route 44 minibuses have been without an effective association, but added their strong desire to redevelop another. You take a load from the park to go to Grove. Shall drop by the time you reach fishery, you're only taking three portions to Grove. So if you check 13 passengers in the bus, so if you drop off 10 by fishery, that's $600. And you take three to Grove, that's $300 a month. That make it $900. And sometimes you come down from Grove and you, you get a load, sometimes you don't get a load. And the gas that you need right now to drive to Grove and back is thirteen to $1,400. So how it can pay per trip? So how it can pay? It cannot pay. Tell you they got to, you got to have a conductor. If you don't have a conductor in police staff, the bus, they charge you for not carrying a conductor. Plus, if you got somebody just pulling the door and making change, they're charging the person because they said the person got a conductor like he's acting in the capacity of a conductor. Yeah. So how we could make a money at the end of the day when you got to drive and pay ten thousand dollars gas, a conductor got to get four thousand, you got to get six thousand give us man. Who you got in no way to put food on the table for sending the children to school? Meanwhile, several miles away, the Route 44 minibus drivers also protested against the rise in the price for gas. <laughs> Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius.
On a humanitarian note, a single mother is pleading for public assistance as she is left to fend for her eight-year-old son, who is still bedridden, following a vehicle accident in December 2017. Eight-year-old Matthew Zaman, who has been bedridden for over six months, is now in the care of his mother. The boy's condition came about after he was involved in a vehicle accident. It is alleged that the child was hit by a passing vehicle in the vicinity in Felicity on the east coast of Demerara in December 2017. Following that incident, the child was diagnosed with a fractured skull, swollen brain and bruised lungs, his mother Bibi Shanaz Khan explained. He stayed 13 days in the intensive care unit, after which a breathing tract and energy tube was inserted into his body through a surgical procedure. So he was in hospital like from the 18th till up to the 30th of January. Then he come home like a week. He spent a week and a couple of days and then he got back. And he spent the whole February, then he go back till the second time March he come back. Well he ain't going but he going to the clinic, he going to um therapy two times a week and he go to the clinic for the track. He go for the change of energy tube like every ten days. And he just go to the surgical clinic, this Dr. Duke clinic for the head. The single parent mother of eight children says she left her job as a cook to ensure her son recuperates. As such, she's calling on the public to financially support her. Well, I got two daughters used to assist me, but then it's getting more hard now because they're giving me more, like, for carry to the therapy that change the energy tube. Then you got to feed if you pay liquid, so everything has got to be straining. If you make the soup steam green, you got to strain it. Khan says her son is always laid in a stiff position. He does not talk or move. He uses his tongue or eyes as communication signals, according to Khan. On a positive note, doctors had indicated to the mother that it is possible for the child to recover with the aid of intensive home care. Khan says the driver, who is responsible for the accident, has been charged with dangerous driving and placed on $100,000 bail. The matter is still ongoing at the Sparnda Magistrate Court. Sandy Ramotar, Frame TV's News Update. Touching on the oil and gas industry, Guyana is poised to start natural gas and liquid petroleum production. However, an oil consultant is urging the government to present effective and realistic solutions to meet the demand for reliable and cost-effective electricity. Here is more. Attorney at Law and oil consultant Charles Ramson Jr. During an exclusive interview with News Update, revealed that with the production of petroleum and natural gas, Guyana will be in a position where certain important provisions ought to be made for the country's demand for clean and affordable energy. Ramson stressed this demand for energy is an issue that needs to be addressed. He argued that at present, there is a strike in lower capacity to accommodate for the great electricity demand in the country. What people need to know is that um, the natural gas project, which is the, the use of natural gas to power our electricity demands, um, that will not start before oil production starts. And quite possibly it can't start maybe a year, possibly two years um, after oil production starts. So you've being able to have the information out there about um, the possibility of a natural gas project that will help us to meet our energy demands and bring down electricity costs. We've got to be clear in our minds that that's not an immediate solution. Um, and we have immediate uh, demands for a solution right now. And while it's good that we must be able to discuss these things for the future, how do we fix what's happening right now? Number one, we have a shortfall in, in our demand, our baseload um, power is not even, is not even um, at full capacity. Um, our de baseload demand of our power is not even at full capacity, much, le much less your peak load. Um, so if you, if you re and, and then as we move towards oil production, our expansion on capacity will just increase. 
Ramson explained that as the country continues to experience an influx of visitors and returning Guyanese, now is the time to instill certain measures to properly manage the natural gas resource for the benefit of all Guyanese. Uh, if you don't have the additional capacity uh, into the system, it's going to cause a lot more blackouts, that's first. And then second, um, how do we deal with the price as it is, as it is now? We're paying one of the highest rates for electricity in, for electricity in the region. So we've, we need a solution. Electricity is the, the most basic of all solutions. I'm happy that, that the natural gas project is being discussed for the future, but we need a solution now. And I think people need to know that um, you've got to press their representatives to be able to give them a solution now. Reporting from TV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. A promising fishing industry here in Guyana may not be affected by the large operation of ExxonMobil out in the deep waters. This assurance was given by a senior official of the oil and gas company. Here are the details. With a continued exploration for oil bearing sandstones in Guyana's Starburg block by U.S. oil giant ExxonMobil, there have been gloomy speculations about the possible negative effects it can have on Guyana's fishing industry. Some fear that in the event of an oil spill, the fishing industry would be crippled due to the large scale operation of ExxonMobil in the deep waters. However, Guyana has nothing to fear about ExxonMobil interfering with and shrinking its fishing industry assures the company. Senior Director of Government and Public Affairs of ExxonMobil Guyana, Kimberly Brissenton, says that fishing is welcomed in the Starbuck block. Brissenton said that while fishing is allowed, when the floating production, storage and offloading vessel is set up to start operations in 2020, a two nautical mile radius will be enforced. Within that two nautical mile radius, fishermen cannot operate for safety and security reasons, Brissenton added. And that's customary everywhere around the world. Um, but that two mile radius around the FPSO, it would take 38 FPSOs, not just one. It would take 38 boats offshore with that two mile radius around it exclusion zone to take up 1% of the Guyana offshore. 38, so we're talking one. So we are at like 0.003% of an exclusion zone in a very deep water, right? So, so where the Lisa Field is, is extremely deep water. So the majority of Guyanese commercial fishermen, fishing activities happen on shore of our operations. And we have done that research as part of our EIA. Brissenton also stated, that there is a growing tuna industry as deep water fishing is ongoing. She noted that while commercial fishing is taking place just off the Ghana shore, trawlers are venturing into the deep waters. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some deep water trawlers and tuna who could go that far, absolutely. Uh, and they do. We're seeing a growing tuna industry. Uh, but still, it, it's such a small exclusion zone around one boat, it in no way will impact the fishing, commercial fishing in Guyana through our operations. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The opposition party is calling on the public to mount pressure on the government for adjustments to be made for fuel prices. He claims the government has enough fiscal room to do such. Here is more. The government has enough fiscal space to make an adjustment to the increased fuel prices, says opposition leader Bar Jagdew. This comes after many motorists, especially minibus operators, have bemoaned the increased fuel prices. So by reducing the tax when the price goes up, you're not even, you're not even affecting the quantum of taxes collected because it's ad valorem. It's levied as a percentage of. So the bigger the base, the, the, the price of the, the higher the price of the fuel, your, your taxes would be higher. 
This followed protest actions by drivers who are peeved by the increased prices. The prices of fuel is said to have hiked as a result of the impact of hurricanes on the oil industry. Jagdeo predicted that there might be an increase in the cost for transport as a result of the adjustment. True public pressure must adjust the rate at the pump. They do have a lot of room. They have the fiscal space as well as the, the tax play to make that adjustment. But, of course, they're tone deaf. He claimed the government might not want to make an adjustment as their interest lies in the collection of revenues. That's a wrap for MTV News Updates Weekend Review. The newscast can be viewed online on our MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us Monday, June 4 at 7 hours 30 for an edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I'm Sandy Ramutar, thanking you for watching.